Good morning and welcome to the Story Church. Service is about to begin, but before it does, I would just love to welcome each and every one of you. If this is your first time here, or even if you are a regular attender who need to update some info, would you just text CONNECT to the number you see on your screen? One thing that we value here highly at the Story Church is prayer. And so if you have a prayer request, we would love to partner with you and pray for you during this time as well. You can do so by texting prayer and the prayer request to the number on your screen. And last but not least, whether we are online or in person, we can't do what we do here at the Story Church without your generous gifts. In order to give, would you just text GIVE to the number on your screen? Once again, thanks for joining us for service. guys have been with us for a little while, you know that that is a big problem for me. I always forget to unmute my microphone. But hey, now that you can hear me, I'm so glad that you guys are with us. If you're here with us in person or whether you're joining us online, we're just so glad that you're with us this morning. Uh, if you're with us in person, would you stand up? We're just going to do a little singing this morning.
Good morning, good morning. How we doing? Good, good. Hey, I'm excited that you guys are here joining us this morning. I also uh, shout out if you're joining us online. Good morning to you as well. We are so thankful that you are here with us, tuning in as line online with us as well. Why don't you just give us a wave online, whatever it might be. Uh, and in person here, why don't you just turn around and wave to somebody, Air 5, whatever it is, before you take a seat from me. Like I said, if this is your first time joining us or maybe your first time online joining us, uh, I'd just like to, again, welcome you. My name is Kyle. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at the Story Church. And uh, if you would, would you just, uh, if this is your first time or maybe this is your second time back, would you just go on and scan our digital communication card? It's just a simple way that we can stay up to date with you and keep all of the info current and also just give you all of our latest updated stuff as well. So go on and scan that uh, QR code. It should be uh, popping up hopefully on the screen. Um, and then next, I also want to share just a few brief things. Um, this is kind of uh, more announcements than I usually might have, but bear with me, okay? Um, number one is this, um, giving. If, uh, if you have set up a regular gift of giving, I just want to personally just say from, from the story staff, the church here, just thank you. Thank you for your regular tithes and offering. Thank you for your constant and generous gift. Um, it helps us to do what we are able to do, to continue to minister and impact our community, all for the glory of God. So thank you. If, and if maybe you've given sporadically, um, from the bottom of my heart, truthfully, thank you. Thank you for your gifts. Thank you for your gifts that you give, because they help us impact people li people's lives. And for those of us who maybe have never given before, Today's a good day to think about it and to start. A lot of us maybe don't know this, but we pay as, as a Wesleyan church, we pay into a tithe, which is, it goes to USF. And as part of that, um, most of us probably wouldn't understand or know that our USF has actually helped almost 600 nurses right now learn and grow in the middle of this pandemic. Our tithe through the USF and through the Wesleyan church is helping almost 600 nurses prepare to help us stay healthy and to continue in caring for us. And, and, and I celebrate that because in the middle of all of this, I just celebrate that we can play a part even through our gifts and our giving and our support, not only of this church, but of the greater, larger church that we're a part of. And so that's just a simple thing that we are able to continue to pour into and support and just show love on families. Uh, and and a few other things is, is number one is this is, um, I don't know if all of us have heard quite yet or not, but um, yesterday there was an accident, an incident actually that happened at Grand Valley State University. And it just reminded me heading into this morning that we might not know the battle that each and every one of us is facing. I don't know all the details of what happened at Grand Valley. and I don't need to know. What I do know is this, is that there's probably battles that each and every one of us has walked in with today that we're dealing with, that we're facing. Whether that's depression, anxiety, concern, worry. Maybe for some of us, this is the first holiday without a loved one. Maybe for others of us, this is the first holiday coming out of a relationship. I, I don't know, whatever it might be, though. I want you to know, and in, in online and in, in person here, um, we want to pray for you, and we want to pray with you. And so if you, if you would, if you have a prayer request, and I, I, would, I would greatly appreciate it if you would allow us to just pray with you. Would you text the word prayer to the number? I think it's on the screen. I, I don't know for sure, but 616-259-5757. If you have a prayer request, we'd love the opportunity to just lift you up in prayer and pray with you. It'd be a blessing for us as a staff here at the, the Story Church and our prayer team to pray alongside you in these times. And then I have just two more. Last, uh, first is this is, if you're interested in serving here at the Story, we'd love to get you involved. We, whether that is, um, you know, serving our kids' ministry, we'd love to plug you in there. Whether that is, and I, I, this one sounds really different, but um, I was challenged last week by it is, 
there's, there's some of us who have the gift of cleaning. That is not me. My Courtney, my wife, probably could attest to that. I have the gift of putting stuff away in a box and say, hey, we're good. Let's watch some football. You know what I mean? I'm good at watching football. I'm not really good at cleaning. But if you have the gift of cleaning, and maybe you would love the opportunity to serve the church in that way, I'd love if, if you would just maybe just find me afterwards and say, hey, I'd love to help and clean, or I'd love to help and serve in this capacity, whatever that might be. Winter's coming, so maybe that means like, hey, I'd love to help and serve in keeping our sidewalks clean. Hey, I'd love and help and serve in fill in the blank. We're so gracious, or so thankful that we have someone every single winter who donates a plow, a plowing service to our church. And so whatever it is, however you, maybe God's leading you to serve, I'd just love if you would just continue to ad- explore that. So don't forget about that. And last but not least is this, is um, we have our Christmas Eve service coming up in a few short days here. I don't know about you, but maybe it feels a little weird to think like Christmas is literally right around the corner. There was snow a little bit yesterday, and it reminded me that that means that winter is kind of here. And I'm not a fan of the cold, but what I was reminded of in that moment is as I watched the snow fall and and everything, I was reminded that for me, isn't that kind of an interesting way of how Jesus came? When the snow was coming, it wasn't this big, loud storm like a thunderstorm. I didn't see flashes of lightning. I didn't see these or hear these loud bangs of thunder. It fell quietly to the ground in all of its beauty as it sat and rested on the ground. And when Jesus came, isn't that how he came? Quietly in the night, quietly coming to earth, but yet rested so beautifully and elegantly, a baby in a manger. I'm reminded that as Christmas Eve is right around the corner, there's a good chance that we have a neighbor or a family member who needs to hear the good news that hope of the world, hope for our world, came. And his name is Jesus. And so I want to I wanna challenge you, whether you're online, whether you're in person here. I want to challenge you to th- think of maybe two or three people who need to be here with you Christmas Eve whether that's physically in these seats or online on your couch or on their couch. Who is a a few people, a few different names that need to hear that Jesus is coming. And we're going to talk about that. Jesus came to save us. Who needs to hear that good news in this, this time? Because we all can agree that we probably know of a few different people who need to hear that the hope of the world came. His name is Jesus, and he wants to be a part of our lives. And so as we continue to worship, I want to just, um, first, uh, before I pray, I want to excuse any of our um, kind of chapter two elementary school kids. They can head on out. We have, again, Miss Sarah's in the back there. Um, We have an opportunity where we get to pour into our children, where we get to pour into them and teach them all about Jesus and his love. And so as as they kind of make their way out, I I would just love the opportunity to pray for us as we continue to worship. So I want to invite you to stand back up again and just join me in prayer as we continue to worship. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your presence. And Father, I pray that you would just continue to give us a real encounter with you. I pray, Lord, that you would just allow us to continue to see you, feel you, and hear you in new ways today. Make yourself known, Lord. And we praise in your name. Amen.
The Sovereign Lord has filled me with His Spirit. He has chosen me and sent me to bring good news to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to announce release to captives, and freedom to those in prison. He has sent me to proclaim that the time has come when the Lord will save his people and defeat their enemies. He has sent me to comfort all who mourn, to give to those who mourn in Zion joy and gladness instead of grief, a song of praise instead of sorrow. They will be like trees that the Lord himself has planted. They will all do what is right and God will be praised for what he has done. Weariness. Weariness is defined by my good friend Webster, the dictionary, as extreme tiredness or fatigue. If we're being honest, if we're being honest, um, Maybe we're feeling this exact feeling today. Weariness of new protocols, trying to keep up with them all. Weariness of a new season, all that brings. Weariness of the busyness of life lately. And maybe even weariness of anticipating what these next few weeks might look like. And in the midst of all of this feeling, we seek to find answers. And we seek to find hope and how to operate. Last week we talked about the reality that there's a problem with the world. There's a great big problem, and there's a reality of this weary world, and how in the world does a world that is tired, that is broken and weary, how does a world rejoice in that? We looked at the reality of Isaiah the prophet, and how he talked about in, those world, in the world that he lived in, it was weary, it was broken, it was sinful as well. And we looked a little bit as it foreshadowed ahead into the world of Jesus as he operated with the Jews and the Gentiles. And the brokenness and sinfulness and weariness that he himself endured too. And we can't forget that there's a reality that we are standing in the middle of weariness right now even. In the middle of all of this right now. There's sin and brokenness that endured and entered in the fall. In Genesis, sin entered the world. And maybe just at that moment, maybe just maybe, weariness began. Let's not forget about the sin of disobedience, of God's people not keeping his laws, the covenant that was made, the sin and disobedience of even us, against God. We have a problem. But I got good news this morning. God gave us the answer. God gave us the answer. Each week we've been digging into this text in Isaiah 61, and we're going to dig into it today, where it talks about the weary world, but it talks about the answer. And today, I want to talk about the answer. And in order to understand the answer in the fullest, we have to remember that there is poverty and brokenness in the day that Isaiah wrote this. There is poverty and brokenness. There's a physical pro poverty, but there's also spiritual poverty that people were seeking to be saved from. There was also uh, a moment of, of radical unjustness, injustice, and a radical brokenness in this world. And they're seeking hope. They're seeking a Savior, a Messiah. And Isaiah writes about it. And what's intriguing is if you go on and you read this whole entire chapter, it's 11 verses. Read the whole entire chapter. It's intriguing that there's a chunk of it that is, is a, a certain tone 
to it. It comes from the Messiah's perspective. And today I want to dig into that video, those three verses. That's what we're talking about today, those three verses. And so if you have your Bible, why don't you pull it on out or um, turn it on, whatever it might be. If you're at home with us, why don't you pull it up as well. But um, we're also going to have it on the screen here. This is Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. And I don't know why it says 6-1. I, I don't know. But it's 61 if you're following along with us online and stuff. Um, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. For the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to comfort the brokenhearted, to proclaim that captives will be released and prisoners will be freed. He has sent me to tell those who mourn that the time of the Lord's favor Remember, this is what we also said last, last week. We talked about the year of Jubilee, the time of the Lord's favor has come, and with it, the day of God's anger against their enemies. This is prophetic speaking. This is messianic speaking. This is the perspective coming from the Messiah. The, the hope of the world, the, the Savior is speaking. And what's intriguing here is that you can read this and you can understand that so many of these words are important in this text. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. These are words that that are pointing directly to one person and one person only. Jesus. It points back to Jesus, but ultimately it points back to also what we know that Isaiah wrote about in a few chapters previous, the suffering servant. Isaiah 52 and 53 is is these chapters where we get this picture, this reality of who the servant will be, the suffering servant will be, the Messiah and how he will act and what he will do. These passages in these two chapters, if you've never written, or sorry, if you've never read 52 and 53 in, in the book of Isaiah, I highly recommend it. These chapters point directly to Jesus and his heart and who he is. And as you read it, you start to understand that we're introduced to this coming servant in the Messiah, and his name will be Jesus. He's going to be neglected, he's going to be mistreated, persecuted, and ultimately killed. But God is sending his answer to his people. God is sending his answer to sin to his people. And his answer is Jesus. When you read these chapters, you read things that make us squirm even. Remember, Isaiah was written hundreds of years before Jesus would ever walk this earth. But yet, Isaiah pens these words that that Jesus fulfills to the to the T to the core. He will be persecuted. He will be whipped. He will be broken. He will be beaten beaten. His own people would neglect him and forsake him. His own people will turn away from him. And we understand at the core of this that Jesus comes to reconcile the damage that sin has made. Last week we, saw, we said that sin has done great damage, so there needs to be a great work of redemption. Last week we focused a lot on the damage, the brokenness. So what's the redemption? Go on and read it. You can see it, right? That he will preach good tidings to the poor. He will heal the brokenhearted. He will proclaim liberty to the captives. He will open the prison to those who are bound. He will proclaim and fulfill the acceptable year of the Lord, the year of Jubilee. Jesus will answer all of those things. Isaiah expresses that this Messiah, the Messiah, Jesus, will change and exchange everything. And it goes on in in verse 3. This is what it says in verse 3. To all who mourn in Israel, he will give a crown of beauty for ashes, a joyous blessing instead of mourning, festive praise instead of despair. In the righteousness, righteousness, they will be like great oaks that the Lord has planted for his own glory. And I want to point out something that's intriguing about this text. 
It's intriguing that Isaiah uses a specific word here. When you read this text, Isaiah uses a specific word, and the word is instead. Instead. And when you go and you read this, this, this word in the original language, it's a translation of almost a, a direct substitution or exchange. When we understand that, it brings a whole other meaning to this. That the Messiah is going to essentially exchange a, a crown of beauty for your ashes on your head. That the Messiah will exchange, he will substitute blessing instead of mourning. He wants to exchange, he wants to substitute what we offer for what he offers. Messiah wants to give us something of him while he takes something that we offer, something of the world. And what's so intriguing here is that when, when it writes this crown of beauty, it's this elegant and exquisite headdress. When we think of crowns, think of the, the beauty that is associated with them. Think of the value that is associated with them. Think of maybe the jewels or maybe the, the gold that is on them. And when you think of that, compare that now to ashes. I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, have been around a fire where there are ashes at the end. If I set two of those, a crown and ashes out, and I said, hey, you get to choose what one you put on your head. My guess is, is that most of us, if not all of us, would choose the crown. Pretty fair assessment. You see, because ashes also represent, represent something that was dead, remember. Dead. The sheer comparison between ashes, which represented brokenness, pain, death, and the comparison of that replaced with beauty, worth, joyous praise. There's really no comparison, is there? And that led me starting to think about the moment where Jesus exchanged everything that I had in my life for himself. Do you remember that moment? Do you remember the moment where, where you had the moment where you looked and you said, you know, God, I want to give you all my brokenness, all my pain, all my sin. And would you exchange that and give me your forgiveness? Give me your love, your grace, and your peace. Do you remember the moment where, where maybe you had this, this external moment where you just fell to your feet or, or fell to your knees and you're falling down and you're just crying out for God to exchange the brokenness in your life for the wholeness that he can offer? Do you remember the moment maybe where you're feeling lost, hopeless, broken, captive to sin and more? And do you remember the moment where he set you free from all of that? Do you remember that moment where it all changed? Because he exchanged what you had to offer for what he has to offer. My hope is you can remember that moment. The way that Chris Conrad puts it, uh, he leads our, our region is never forget how darkness felt. And I love that. Because I've heard story after stir, story after story of people who've walked in darkness for so long and then they meet Jesus. And everything can change. And I, I remember these stories. I remember a story of talking with someone who spoke of what it meant for them, this moment of this exchange, where they lived this life, a life that was full of drugs, a life that was full of alcohol addictions, a life that was full of pornography addictions, bad relationships, a life that was full of sin. And, and 
I remember having these conversations with him and talking with him about what it meant when he truly met and understood who Jesus was. Where, where he felt this exchange happen. That God exchanged his drugs and his addiction to drugs for God's peace. When God exchanged his alcohol addiction for God's comfort. When he exchanged his sin for God's freedom, his redemption and restoration in his life. You see, when those exchanges happen, we, we can understand that relationships change. Interactions radically become different. And God works deeply in those moments. God desires to exchange, to give what only he can give to us. And when we really think about it, this exchange is not really fair. Think of what we exchange. What do we give to God? I give him my brokenness. I give him my pain. I give him my anxiety, my worry, my frustrations, my emotions, my sin, my addictions. My that, That's a lot, and it's all like nasty stuff, right? It's stuff that makes us uncomfortable. It's okay to say it. And then God says, give me that, and what does he give us? Peace. Love. Grace, mercy, redemption, restoration, himself. If we take a step back, this exchange is slightly unfair to say the least, right? Like he's getting the, he's taking all my junk and I'm receiving all of the beautiful rewards. But he desires that exchange. And when we read these words in Isaiah, we have to understand that there's a bigger dynamic. That God takes all of these things to give us all that he offers and all that he is. And he goes on in this chapter, and I love it. He goes on in this chapter to talk about this word justice. It even says it in verse, verse uh, 7 here. He goes on to say 7 and, and uh, it's 7 and 8. It's not going to be on the screen, and he says, instead of shame and dishonor, you're going to enjoy a double share of honor. You'll possess a double portion of prosperity in the land. Everlasting joy will be yours. Verse 8, for I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing, and I have faithfully, and I will faithfully reward my people for their suffering and make an everlasting covenant with them. Justice. This word, I think, for some of us, sometimes when we hear this word, we think of it only in our own humanistic mentality. But see, God loves justice so that you're not robbed of another day from addictions. Because he sees the injustice that addictions have on us. God loves justice so that it's justice to not be held hostage another moment to the brokenness in life. It's justice to not be taken advantage of another second by sin. And God provides us justice, freedom, and healing through his answer. And his answer is Jesus. God's answer to sin is Jesus. Plain and simple. God's answer is Jesus. All that Jesus will do and does is for his kingdom. It's all for his glory, all for his praise, all for his presence here with us. And I remember in this season, the season that we're in, it's a season called Advent. And traditionally, we celebrate with these candles, and, and we're doing things a little differently this year. And that's okay. But the season of Advent is a season of longing and waiting And I started to ask myself the question of like, well, what does Advent really mean? What does it mean to me? What does it mean to others? And I, I stumbled across this, this quote, and it's a longer quote by David Cassidy. And this is what he writes. What does Advent mean? It means that death, disease, despair, drug addiction, homelessness, murder, hate, war, orphanhood, poverty, hunger, thirst, tears, and grief 
They all have an expiration date. That these are not the original intention for the world. And they won't see the dawn of the new creation. What does Advent really mean? It means that dimly burning wicks will not be extinguished. Whew. Anybody ever feel like you're burning multiple wicks at the same time in this current season? Dimly at best, right? Dimly burning wicks will not be extinguished. It means that faith, even assailed by doubt, will survive. That love assaulted by fear will prevail. That the corridors, corridors of power will never be where ultimate justice shall arise. And it will lie in ruins. What does Advent mean? It means that the grave is a comma. It's not an exclamation point. It means that our poverty will be met by the overflowing riches of grace. It means that the prisoner will surely go free. The oppressed will be enthroned. And that the marginalized will be embraced. God gave us his answer as clear as day. His name is Jesus. God gave us the answer to sin in the world. His name is Jesus. I can't say it enough. And here's the reality is we can't say it enough because our world needs to hear it over and over again. We have the answer to all of our issues. We have the answer to the brokenness, to the sin, to the pain in the world. We have hope. His name is Jesus. In a world right now that is seeking and searching at every single turn for hope, for peace, for comfort, they need to hear that name, Jesus, ringing loud and clear. We know the one that takes all of the sin while we get all of Jesus. We know the one that takes all of the brokenness while we get all of his wholeness. We know the one that takes all of the weight, all of the pain of the world while we get all of the comfort and the love of God. We know the one. He came in the form of a baby in the middle of a night to a teenage girl. He came. We know him. And our world needs to know him as well. But we get caught up. We get caught up in this day. We get caught up in the world. We get caught up in the busyness and the chaos. And we become weary. And if I'm just going to be honest with you, we become tired and frustrated, anxious, and concerned. And if I'm going to be brutally honest, I feel like I'm paddling that ship right around, right along with you. I'm weary too. If I'm brutally honest, navigating through a pandemic and trying to lead ministries and churches is difficult, even without a pandemic. <laughs> and if I'm really honest, like, I have to be reminded and I have to remember that I know the one that gives me hope. I know the one that can give me peace and comfort. I have to be reminded that God wants to give me more of himself than what this world has to offer me. This year, 2020, many of us, I'm sure, if not all of us, including myself, have maybe felt like we've been beaten down. Maybe felt like we've been hurting and bruised. And maybe even for some of us right now watching online or even in this room that... Um, we don't know if we can get back up. And we try and, and we do all these things on our own and we keep trying and we keep trying, but it just seems like we keep falling short. And we're left longing and waiting and desiring for more, something better. Lately, I've been feeling that. I've been feeling that pressure. Full disclosure, I've been feeling the pressure of trying to navigate, you know, leading and leading well. But on a personal note, I've been feeling, feeling the pressure of, of becoming extremely frustrated, angry, anxious. And so many other emotions as, as Courtney and I are just navigating this journey with our, our youngest foster. 
I'm feeling that, that emotion of growing tired because I'm, I'm waiting on this, these paperwork to get processed. And did you know that the government slows down in a pandemic? Did you know it takes forever to process paperwork to begin with, but then you throw a pandemic in it and you're like, is this ever going to happen? Right? I'm, maybe it's just me. But I'm feeling this like frustration of like, well, can't it just be done? Why do I have to go get my fourth background check? Why do I have to go get this done and this done and this? And maybe it's just me. Like, my wife has so much more patience than I do. Because I'm like, oh, I sent it in two days later. We should be approved. Let's roll, baby. Right? I've done this before. Just check the box. I'm, I'm feeling this. I'm feeling this weariness. I'm, I'm growing tired. I'm growing frustrated. Because I want to make it official. Man, everything inside of my heart wants to make it official that that is my son. And I want the world to know officially, legally, whatever it is, that that is my boy. That's my son. I'm growing tired of waiting. I'm growing frustrated in it. One of the things that sounds so crazy is like, I, I want him to be on our own insurance. When was the last time you thought you'd say, oh, yeah, I want more people on my own insurance, right? But like, I want it. Why? Because it, it makes things so much easier for us. I'm growing weary. I want to be able to raise him in our guidelines, in our own way without being told how to do it and when to do it and all this other stuff. I'm, I'm growing weary. Maybe you can identify with that. Maybe you're growing weary in this season too because you're just longing and waiting and it feels like there might not be an end in sight. Because even when you say, and you hear it, right? Like, oh, the end is near. The light is at the end of the tunnel. I'm like, yeah, but they're just going to keep adding to the tunnel. That's what it feels like. <laughs> I'm not like, I'm growing tired, growing weary. But even in the midst of all this, even in the midst of all this, and here's what's intriguing to me is I'm reminded of this. I'm reminded that I'm relying on the wrong things. In the midst as I'm growing weary and frustrated and all these other things with what's happening right now in life, I'm relying on man and the government to fix my issues. <laughs> Amen, right? Like I'm, I'm relying on the wrong things. I'm relying on people and things that have no power to change what's actually happening in this world. I'm relying on man to fix my issues. I'm relying on the government to speed things along. I'm relying on my tax dollars to do fill in the blank. I'm relying on the wrong person. And when I remember, when I remind myself over and over that God wants to take all of my worry, my weariness, my tiredness, my frustrations, my anger, my doubts, whatever it might be, that God wants to take all of this and he wants to give me his peace and his comfort. You just simply wants to give me his son. And with his son, all of that weariness and tiredness, I can, I can know that it's all going to be okay. I was reminded that I still need to go to God and say, God, can you exchange me? God, can you give me your peace right now? Because I'm really feeling uneasy. God, can you give me your God, can you give me your grace right now? Can you give me your mercy and your love? God, can you remind me that you are God? And I'm not. Can you exchange me all of this baggage? And can I have all of you instead? That's what he wants to do. Because he sees, he hears, he knows all of that. And he says, just, just come to me. 
I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. As we close today, as the band comes up to close with us, I just want to ask you maybe a simple question. And maybe it's one that we need to sit in for just a moment. What may you be walking with right now? What may you be holding on to right now? What may you be trying to operate with right now that you haven't gone to him and asked him to exchange? What maybe have you been just holding with your hand closed? Saying, oh, I can handle it. I've got this. But really, as you keep holding on to it longer and longer, it begins to hurt more and more. It becomes more out of control, uncertain. And maybe you just need to say, God, can you just take all my doubts and give me your truth? As you're hanging on to all that, maybe you need to just have those words and those moments of, God, can you take all of my pain and just give me your healing? God, can you take all my brokenness, but give me your wholeness? God, can you take all my sin and just give me your forgiveness? God answered. God heard and he knew exactly what we needed. And when God answered, sin never stood a chance. When God answered with his son, Jesus, sin never stood a chance. Brokenness in this world never stood a chance. Weariness (laughs) never stood a chance. So whatever you've walked in with today, maybe as you're sitting on your couch right now, whatever you're holding on to, whatever you've just been walking into thinking you might have it under control, What if you gave it to God? He doesn't fail. He's been faithful, and he will be faithful over and over and over again. God saw what was happening. He knew what was happening. His son was here living in it. And he answered, and he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So come. Come and see for yourself. So as we go into this last song, I want to just give you space. Space for you to just have that conversation with God of exchange, maybe. God, instead of this mourning that I've been going through and grieving that I've been going through, will you give me this? God, instead of this brokenness I've been feeling, will you give me this? Whatever it might be, take this next song, take this next time, whatever it might be, to just communicate and talk with God. He's listening. He hears you. He sees you. And he loves you deeply. Pray.
Father, as we just come before you today, we just ask that you would hear our hearts, hear our cries. And God, we ask that you would exchange whatever baggage and burden we may be carrying, Lord. Exchange it for your presence, your love, and your grace. God, we ask that you would just make yourself known in new ways this week to us, Lord. Would we see you in the creation? Would we hear you in our discussions? Would we understand you as in, in our dreams? Would we just see and feel you in new ways this week, Lord? God, we pray that you would just make yourself known to us, our families, and our neighbors, and our friends. And Father, I ask that you would allow us to just be vessels and tools and instruments, beacons of hope for you and your kingdom, Lord. Stir in us, Lord. We ask this and we pray. In your name, amen. This coming week, who needs to hear that message? Who needs to hear that hope has come? His name is Jesus. That there is hope for a new tomorrow. There is hope for a new day, hope for a new creation. And we can enjoy that hope because he is here and he is near. Amen? Amen. I challenge you to bring someone next week. Whether on your couch, whether in person here, whatever it might be, make sure that they are here and make sure you are as well as we continue to dive into A Weary World Rejoices. I look forward to that. I look forward to seeing you guys next week, guys. God bless. We'll see you soon.